Hello everybody and have a good day. Uh, in this lecture, I want to uh, be discussing the uh, first part of the pathology of the stomach. So before we start uh, discussing the diseases, we um, should have a look at the uh, anatomy and the uh, histology, the normal histology of the stomach. The stomach is uh, formed of uh, the um, um, cardia part, the first part after the gastroesophageal uh, junction, and then the fundus and the body that constitutes uh, most of the surface area of the stomach. Then we uh, have the antrum and then the uh, pylorus or uh, pyloric canal uh, through which the stomach uh, communicates with the duodenum through the gastroduodenal uh, junction or sphincter. Um, diseases of the stomach are uh, subdivided into those that are inflammatory conditions and those that are neoplastic uh, conditions. In the next slide, I will be uh, discussing the uh, uh, normal histology and the normal anatomy of the uh, stomach. So regarding the histology, different areas of the stomach has different uh, cellular populations and different functions for the uh, cells present at these sites. So for the cardia, the main uh, cells that are present there are the mucin secreting foveolar cells, which uh, makes uh, a very um, uh, prominent uh, cell component at this site. Uh, and the thickness of the cardia is um, usually uh, less than the thickness of the mucosa at other sites of the uh, uh, stomach. Uh, then we have the body and the fundus uh, in which the mucosa is um, thicker than that in the cardia uh, and the cellular uh, components are different. So in, this, in these sites we have a prominence of the parietal cells which have an abundant uh, pink eosinophilic granular cytoplasm and it is responsible for the production of acid. In addition we have the chief cells which have the abundant uh, uh, bluish uh, cytoplasm and these cells are responsible for the production of pepsin which is the digestive enzyme in the stomach then we came to the antrum in which the uh, there are the antral glands and uh, we also have the neuroendocrine g cells scattered uh, throughout the crepes and these cells uh, produce the gastrin uh, sometimes it's difficult to find the g cells by the hematoxylin and eosinostain uh, so uh, we uh, so, uh, we use uh, certain amino acid chemical stains to highlight these cells. In addition, as you know, regarding the histology, we have four layers of the wall of the stomach. We have the mucosa, in which we uh, discussed already the types of cells are different in different parts of the stomach. Then we have the um, scolaris mucosa that separates the mucosa from the submucosa and then we had the submucosa then we have the muscularis propria then the adventitia and the serosa of the stomach so these four layers are um, constant throughout the stomach however the cellular contents are different in this drawing you can see the different parts of the stomach and you can see that it is connected proximally to the esophagus by the gastroesophageal junction and at the distal part of the stomach it opens to the duodenum which uh, through the pyloric canal or the pyloric sphincter you can see here the fundus of the stomach and the body that forms the most of the area of the stomach the antral area and you can also see the cardia surrounding the gastroesophageal junction so here in this picture, you can uh, see the different parts of anatomic landmarks of the stomach. Uh, so the cardia, as I said, it's just below the esophagus. And then we have the fundus, uh, the upper part of the stomach, and then the uh, body of the stomach. These two parts uh, forms most of the surface area. And the lesser curvature, uh, uh, as you can see, um, uh, at the area uh, connecting the uh, esophagus and the uh, uh, duodenum uh, 
um, from the uh, right side and then to the left side we have the greater uh, curvature then we have the pylorus and the antrum and uh, then we uh, the stomach will open to the uh, duodenum th through the uh, gastroduodenal junction again this slide uh, illustrates the different parts of the stomach in regard in with regards to the normal histology so the first slide uh, to the um, uh, to the um, uh, right uh, upper border of the slide this is the cardia in which you can see the surface epithelium is highly mucinous it contains cytoplasmic mucin and those are called the foveolar cells of the cardia and you can see that the thickness of the mucosa at this side is different from the thickness of the mucosa at the uh, left uh, uh, picture upper border which is uh, the cardia and the body type uh, epithelial uh, mucosa and the lower picture which represents the antral uh, mucosa the thickness is uh, uh, different the second uh, picture the uh, highly eosinophilic uh, cells that you can see them throughout the mucosa are the parietal cells and among them you can see uh, cells with the bluish cytoplasm also uh, those uh, representing the chief cells so this is in the body and the cardia you can see a lot of parietal cells and this is very important because in some cases of gastritis we can lo uh, lose these uh, cells and uh, this uh, feature can be used as a hint to the disease so keep in mind that in the body and the fundus of the stomach we have a lot of parietal cells and chief cells then we came to the uh, picture at the lower part of the slide. This uh, picture represents the um, antrum and you can see a lot of antral glands that secretes a mucus and uh, we don't see here the parietal cells, uh, gas uh, acid producing cells, but we see uh, neuroendocrine cells, the G cells that produces the gastrin and they are better highlighted by some immunohistochemical stains. The three slides here or the three pictures here uh, represents hematoxylin and eosin stained slides which are which we visualize them under the light microscope inflammatory conditions of the stomach are very common and they are subdivided into four categories those that are acute and those that are chronic acute conditions of the stomach are divided into acute gastritis and acute gastric ulcers and chronic conditions are divided into chronic gastritis and chronic peptic ulcer. Actually, when I say peptic, it means any area that is exposed to the acid and pepsin from the stomach. It could be in the stomach, and it could be the lower part of the esophagus, and it could be the first part of the duodenum, or in other areas of the GI tract where you can find an ectopic gastric tissue producing acid and pepsin. So when I say peptic, it's not necessary to have the disease in the stomach. So let's talk about acute gastritis and gastropathy. These both, both terms are related to the similar conditions. Uh, however, the main difference between acute gastritis and gastropathy is in the morphology under the microscope when we take a gastric biopsy. In acute gastritis, you might see neutrophils, but in gastropathy, you see only regenerative changes in the mucosa due to the damage, but you don't see inflammatory cells. The causes for both conditions include the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which disrupts the protection of the uh, mucosa and we will discuss the mechanism or the pathogenesis of acute gastritis in a while also the use of uh, alcohol a reflux of bile contents from the duodenum to the uh, uh, stomach and uh, this could uh, happen after cer certain surgical procedures that affect the competence of the pyloric sphincter sometimes a stress whether uh, mainly a physiological uh, stress like uh, uh, surgical procedures or uh, critically ill patients also can cause acute gastritis the clinical features are variable some patients are asymptomatic but other patients uh, may experience big gastric abdominal pain nausea and uh, vomiting so the symptoms are related to the severity of the condition
This slide illustrates the uh, mechanisms of our the pathogenesis for uh, acute gastritis and gastropathy and even for chronic gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. All of these uh, um, diseases are uh, interrelated in a way or another uh, because the uh, underlying mechanisms are almost the same. Um, in the stomach, we have a very low pH. The, uh, media in the stomach and the gastric juices are highly acidic and this is uh, uh, a damaging uh, factor by its uh, nature and it can cause uh, damage to the gastric mucosa if it comes in contact in direct contact with the with this highly acidic uh, environment uh, so the no, the acidity and the peptic uh, uh, and the pepsin that is present in the gastric juices are normal damaging factors to the mucosa. However, the mucosa has developed many defensive forces. And when an acute gastritis or chronic gastritis develops, uh, there is an imbalance between these protective factors in the stomach that are naturally present and between the injurious stimuli which we'll, we talk about them in a while. The protective factors in the stomach are uh, variable. We have the surface mucus secretion by the surface epithelial cells which forms a layer of slippery mucus over the epithelial cells protecting them from the damage by acid and pepsin. Uh, also, these epithelial cells produce the bicarbonate ions, which will buffer the solution or they buffer the mucus layer um, uh, because uh, bicarbonates give a slightly alkaline medium near the uh, epithelium. So this mucus layer that is rich in bicarbonate offers a high protection to the uh, mucosa. In addition, we have an, uh, a very good mucosal blood flow all the time to the, to the whole GI tract. And this will keep the regenerative capacity of the GI tract uh, high um, in, in all its parts. The one uh, important uh, protective factor in the stomach is the prostaglandin synthesis. And as you know, prostaglandin is produced from the arachidonic acid by the action of the cyclooxygenase enzyme, whether cyclooxygenase uh, uh, 1 and cyclooxygenase uh, 2. Um, Prostaglandins offers protection by increasing the mucus secretion and bicarbonate production and increasing the blood flow to the uh, stomach mucosa. So any uh, interference with prostaglandin uh, secretion like, uh, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, mainly the non-selective parts, the non-selective uh, uh, forms, uh, can cause reduction in prostaglandin synthesis and can um, decrease these defensive uh, uh, forces and exposes the mucosa to larger damage. The injurious stimuli are uh, variable and we will discuss them in the next slide. Uh, they are uh, represented by the helicobacter biliary infection, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, alcohol and cigarette smoking, uh, the hyperacidity, whatever the cause of the hyperacidity of the stomach, and sometimes reflux of bile, as I said in acute gastritis, uh, can cause uh, injury to the uh, mucosa. Even ischemia or decreased blood flow or decreased oxygen supply to the GI uh, tract or uh, principally here the stomach can um, uh, alter these uh, defensive mechanisms. So uh, in general as uh, a rule for acute gastritis or chronic gastritis or peptic ulcer disease to develop we should have an imbalance between the protective factors of the stomach and the damaging factors. If we have reduction in the protection or increase in the injurious stimuli, this will lead to the end, uh, at the end to chronic gastritis or acute gastritis or even peptic ulcer disease. So again, the pathogenesis of acute gastritis and chronic gastritis and even peptic ulcer disease involves an imbalance between the protective factors that we already mentioned in the stomach and the damaging forces. The damaging forces that can cause damage are mainly non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And as you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they work by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzyme and uh, as a consequence, inhibiting prostaglandin E2 synthesis.
And you know that the prostaglandin is needed as a protective factor for the stomach because it increases the mucus secretion, it increases bicarbonate secretion, and even it increases the blood flow to the stomach. Both non-selective anti non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the selective COX-2 inhibitors can cause uh, uh, damage. However, the effect is higher with the non-selective blockers like aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. The COX-2 inhibitors, they have a milder effect on the stomach, but still they can cause uh, uh, damage. Uh, the second cause or the second damaging force is uremic patients. Uh, those are the renal failure patients and patients with helicobacter pylori infection a bacteria that infects the stomach and we will talk about it later in details when we come to chronic gastritis helicobacter pylori produces a urease enzyme that splits the urea into ammonia the presence of this ammonia it interferes with the um, uh, transport of bicarbonate ions to the mucus layer thereby uh, decreasing the uh, bicarbonate secretion the mu uh, concentration in the mucus and decreasing the uh, protection uh, giving a higher acidic uh, environment old age also plays a role because mucus secretion and bicarbonate secretion uh, they are decreased uh, with advancing uh, age hypoxia is also a very important factor because whether it is caused by ischemia or uh, caused by high altitude for example hypoxia uh, and decreased oxygen supply to the uh, mucosa will uh, result in decreased protective uh, uh, factors also harsh chemicals can cause direct epithelial cell injury like um, in consumption of acids or alkali materials whether as uh, in suicidal attempts or accidental uh, intake of these uh, uh, products they can cause direct damage to the epithelial uh, cells alcohol non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and radiation therapy also can cause direct epithelial injury so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can act by two ways by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis and by directly injuring and damaging the uh, epithelial cells also chemotherapeutic drugs that interferes with dna synthesis and with the mitotic capacity also can affect the gi tract by decreasing proliferation of the cells and uh, causing uh, damage so all of these factors can cause damage and if we have any reduction because they either reduce the protective factors or they can cause a, a direct epithelial uh, injury The morphologic features of acute gastritis and gastropathy are um, non-specific or even uh, minor. The only change that can be seen in endoscopy is just mild hyperemia and uh, edematous mucosa with uh, prominent uh, vasculature. Even uh, with the gastric biopsies, we can see just hyperemia, congestion of the vessels, and uh, edema in the lamina propria. We can see um, some inflammatory cells like neutrophils, lymphocytes, and plasma cells, but they are not very prominent. Uh, if um, in acute gastritis we can see neutrophils, however, in gastropathy we don't see any inflammatory cells. But uh, keep in mind that um, uh, the presence of neutrophils it is not a prerequisite to uh, diagnose acute gastritis. It's mainly the erythema, hyperemia, and the congestion. The presence of neutrophils does not mean it's acute. Neutrophils means that there is an active inflammation and it can be seen in acute gastritis also in chronic gastritis. So neutrophils are not a prerequisite to diagnosis. It is mainly the hyperemia and the uh, redness. Uh, intact surface epithelium is uh, seen, however, in more severe cases, we can see erosions and hemorrhage. And if we see erosions and hemorrhage, we call it acute er erosive hemorrhagic uh, gastritis. By the way, acute gastritis, acute means had, out of sudden, 
uh, as you know from uh, your previous courses, the difference between acute and chronic. It's mainly the time duration. So when the endoscopist refers to you saying that the, the mucosa is highly hyperemic, as you see in this picture, this is a part of the stomach with the red mucosa and hyperemic mucosa. This is what the doctor sees up in endoscopy of the uh, stomach in a patient with acute gastritis. It's mainly the um, hyperemia and the redness. And if we receive a biopsy from a patient, patient with acute gastritis, we see edema in the lamina propria and we see a congestion of the blood vessels in mild cases. Um, uh, presence of uh, neutrophils, as I said, is not a prerequisite, but you, ha you can see neutrophils in acute uh, gastritis, but you can see it in gastropathy. In more severe cases, like in this slide, you can see erosions on the surface and sometimes uh, hemorrhage. And as I said, we can call it uh, at this stage an acute erosive hemorrhagic uh, gastritis. So in this picture, you can see the erosions at the surface with the uh, slight or mild hemorrhage. And uh, if you get closer, you can see a few neutrophils uh, attacking the glands in the lower part of the uh, slide. So this is what you see in a biopsy with, in a, uh, with a patient with acute gastritis. The second category of gastric diseases are called acute gastric ulcers or stress-related mucosal disease because most often these ulcers develop in a background of physiologic stress, severe physiologic stress. Examples on severe physiologic stress include trauma, like patients after road traffic accidents, for example, or in extensive burns uh, in which more the, uh, a large area of the um, a large surface area of the uh, skin uh, is involved by burn. Uh, increased intracranial pressure, uh, patients undergoing uh, major surgeries, uh, and uh, patients with severe medical illnesses like um, uh, critically ill patients who are in the uh, ICU or uh, patients with myocardial infarction, for example. All of these are considered physiological stressful events that can lead to an acute gastric uh, ulcerations. And acute gastric ulcers are divided into several types according to the underlying cause and according to their location within the uh, stomach. Uh, the first one is called stress ulcers and it appears or it occurs in uh, critically ill patients like patients with shock severe hypertension or patients with sepsis or patients with severe trauma as i said after a road traffic accidents so these ulcers that occur in a critically ill patients we call them stress ulcers and the second type of ulcers are called curling ulcers those are peculiar that they occur in the proximal part of the duodenum and they are usually associated with a clinical history of severe pains or trauma the third type of ulcers is called Cushing ulcers and these Cushing ulcers can occur in the stomach, in the duodenum or even in the esophagus and usually they are associated with elevated intracranial pressure and these ulcers have a high risk of perforation. They can rupture to the uh, peritoneum and they can cause peritonitis. So these are the three types of ulcers, stress, acute gastric ulcers, stress ulcers, with stress, physiologic stress, critically ill patients, curling ulcers that accompany burns usually, and cushing ulcers that accompany increased intracranial pressure. So the pathogenesis of these acute gastric ulcers um, involves um, several mechanisms that mainly uh, result in local ischemia. So regarding the stress ulcers, it's mainly the local ischemia, reduced blood flow to the stomach. And this can occur as part of a systemic hypotension or heart failure, for example, in a patients uh, who have underlying clinical illnesses and even uh, uh, to local, uh, re local, uh, locally reduced blood flow due to uh, splanchnic vasoconstriction, that is uh, vasoconstriction of the blood vessels supplying only the GI uh, tract. Uh, so both of these will result in uh, local ischemia, which is the main mechanism by which stress ulcers develop. 
Uh, systemic acidosis also can lead to stress ulcers because it leads to uh, lowering the pH of the cells and resulting uh, acidosis on the cells and uh, resulting in their uh, the uh, in their damage. So low pH in the cells can result in their damage. Uh, however, uh, cyclooxygenase two expression in um, um, the uh, gastric mucosa is considered protective against the stress ulcers. And sometimes the mechanism in cushing ulcers mainly involves uh, direct vagal nerve uh, uh, stimulation. Well, and you know the vagus nerve supplies the uh, stomach and causes uh, uh, acid hypersecretion. So when we have a direct stimulation to the vagus uh, nerve, like in cases of elevated intracranial pressure, which can cause cushing ulcers, uh, this will lead to acid hypersecretion, and this is the mechanism by which cushing ulcers develop. So. As a summary, the pathogenesis of acute gastric ulcers mainly involves ischemia, and in the cases of Cushing ulcers, it is uh, acid hypersecretion due to vagal nerve stimulation. The morphology I mean the macroscopic or microscopic appearance. For uh, acute gastric ulcers, usually we don't get biopsies, but the doctor diagnoses it during endoscopy or depending on the uh, clinical manifestations that the patient presents with. Uh, upon endoscopy, uh, the ga acute gastric ulcers are um, characteristically uh, multiple. Uh, they can be shallow to deep, so they are variable. But uh, an important feature is that the surrounding uh, mucosa around the ulcers is unremarkable. Uh, unlike in the cases of uh, a peptic ulcer, a chronic peptic ulcer that comes as an uh, as a complication of chronic gastritis, the surrounding mucosa can be uh, affected or abnormal. But here in acute gastric ulcers, the ulcers are variable in size, usually less than one centimeter in diameter. They can be shallow to deep and they are multiple, uh, but the surrounding mucosa is, um, or adjacent mucosa is uh, normal. They can occur anywhere in the stomach and the uh, base of the ulcer, it can have a brown to black discoloration. Due to the effect of the gastric juices, the acidic gastric juices on the blood that results from the uh, bleeding ulcer. So the blood, uh, the, the, the red blood, the red colored blood is transformed to a brown or black discoloration due to the effect of uh, acidic uh, juices. An important feature in acute gastric ulcers that they have no scarring, unlike the chronic peptic ulcers. And these ulcers typically heal with re-epithelialization that is complete complete re-epithelialization usually days or weeks after treating the underlying cause so you treat the underlying cause and the ulcer will disappear and these are the main features that are seen in uh, on endoscopy in acute gastric ulcers uh, remember that they are multiple unlike the uh, chronic peptic ulcer which we'll re talk about it later which is usually a one ulcer with a surrounding abnormal uh, inflamed gastric mucosa so in this slide you can see all the features that, that we talked about in the previous uh, slide this is a part of the stomach that is removed during surgery um, uh, you can see the multiple blackish to brownish ulcers that are very small and distributed all over the uh, stomach um, Usually these patients are critically ill patients or patients in the ICU, patients with an underlying uh, uh, stressful conditions, uh, trauma patients. So this is the history of acute gastric ulcers. The patient, uh, the doctor tells you that the patient is in the ICU and the endoscopy shows multiple uh, small uh, ulcers distributed everywhere. The adjacent uh, gastric mucosa, as you can see here, is normal. It's not inflamed. This is the normal color of the gastric mucosa and the background or the base of the ulcer is usually blackish to brownish, as I said, because of the action of the uh, gastric acidic juices on the uh, blood that is uh, uh, that came out from these uh, ulcers. So uh, this is the typical appearance for acute gastric ulcers. And when we discuss the uh, peptic, uh, chronic peptic ulcers later on, you will see that it is totally uh, different. As I said, usually we don't receive uh, 
um, biopsies for acute uh, gastric ulcers because they are diagnosed based on on the uh, clinical backgrounds the patient is in the icu and the presence with hematomesis or a uh, gastric pain or uh, upon endoscopy the doctor sees these uh, um, different um, multiple uh, ulcers distributed everywhere so the diagnosis uh, is uh, right away without any biopsy how do the patients present? I already mentioned some points in the previous slides. So the patient is typically an, a severely ill patient in the ICU or after a road traffic accident. And he started uh, uh, complaining of like nausea and vomiting. Sometimes the vomitus is uh, bloody stained. We call it a coffee ground hematemesis. And uh, we already uh, discussed the meaning of hematemesis, vomiting of blood. Why it's coffee ground appearance? Because because of the action of the acidic juices of the stomach on the uh, fresh blood so it turns to a uh, brown discoloration that's why we call it coffee ground hematemesis and also melina i discussed melina in previous lectures and what does that it mean uh, it, uh, mil the presence of melina indicates always an upper uh, gi uh, bleeding now um, some cases can present with more degrees of uh, hemorrhage and they can uh, uh, they, they will need uh, blood transfusion but this is in a minority of patients most of the patients presents with just uh, minor amounts of coffee ground uh, hematemesis as a complication uh, a perforation perforation is a serious complication that can occur in a subset of patients the most important Thing in acute uh, gastric ulcers is the prophylaxis. So any patient who is critically ill in the, uh, or uh, suffering from any physiological stress, even after surgery, for example, the best thing is to offer prophylaxis by proton bump inhibitors, which decreases the acid secretion, so they will protect the mucosa from the uh, ulceration. So prophylaxis is the best way of prevention and the outcome of these ulcers depends on the severity of the underlying cause. So we treat the underlying cause and as I said there is a complete healing and complete re-epithelialization of the mucosa. So here we come to the chronic gastritis, which is a very, very common disease in outpatient clinics and in the gastroenterology clinics, and it is a, a major cause of the uh, upper endoscopic uh, procedures uh, performed for patients. The uh, chronic gastritis is different from acute gastritis in which the symptoms are less severe and the duration of the symptoms is more prolonged. So again, we came to the difference between acute and chronic it's mainly the time and the severity of the symptoms so chronic symptoms are prolonged in duration and less severe in uh, nature the causes of chronic gastritis are divided into helicobacter pylori associated gastritis helicobacter pylori is a gram negative bacillus bacteria uh, and it uh, it is the most common cause of chronic gastritis uh, then autoimmune atrophic gastritis, which constitutes less than 10% of cases of chronic gastritis. Less common causes includes the chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, you remember that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can also cause acute gastritis and acute gastric ulcers, but the chronic use of them also is responsible for chronic gastritis. A radiation injury uh, and chronic bile reflux, the chronic bile reflux. So all of these are the causes, but still the most important, and I think it is, it is responsible for almost uh, 75 to 80 percent of cases of chronic gastritis, is the helicobacter pylori uh, bacteria. أو اللي يسم بيسموها البكتيريا الحلزونية. So symptoms of chronic gastritis are somewhat similar to those of acute gastritis, but they are less severe and more uh, prolonged. So nausea and upper abdominal discomfort, upper abdominal pain, uh, vomiting, and sometimes hematomesis, although hematomesis is uncommon in the chronic gastritis, but it do occur in some cases. So upper abdominal pain and nausea and uh, vomiting.
So here we come to the most common cause of chronic gastritis, the Helicobacter pylori uh, bacteria, uh, H. pylori bacteria, which causes a revolution in uh, uh, medicine after the discovery of the association between H. pylori bacteria and the peptic ulcer uh, disease. Because before the discovery of H. pylori, it was not thought that the uh, chronic gastritis is caused by a pathogen. It's, it was like a revolution after this discovery. Uh, the Helicobacter pylori bacteria is a spiral-shaped or curved-shaped uh, bacteria. Uh, that is a gram-negative bacillus. And they can be seen on gastric biopsy specimens uh, on uh, the mucus layer uh, that is uh, present over the uh, mucosa. And they uh, have developed many protective factors uh, and virulent factors for themselves to protect themselves from the uh, acidic gastric juices. And we will discuss these virulent factors in a while. So these bacteria are spiral shaped or curved. And we can see them under the light microscope in gastric biopsy from patients with chronic gastritis. They can be demonstrated on the H&E stains or with certain uh, other uh, special uh, stains like Gimza stain. This bacteria is present in almost all duodenal ulcers. It is present in the stomach of patients with duodenal ulcers and in the majority of patients with gastric ulcers and chronic gastritis. So this will lead us to the uh, fact that all duodenal ulcers are caused by Helicobacter pylori. But gastric ulcers and the chronic gastritis, most of them are caused by H. pylori, but other causes are there like autoimmune gastritis, bile reflux, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, as I mentioned in the previous slides. The Helicobacter pylori acute infection is usually subclinical, and this bacteria is usually acquired in childhood through drinking of contaminated food and water. Uh, so it's common in the uh, areas uh, that uh, are that have poor sanitation and crowding and um, uh, poverty. Uh, the acute infection is silent or subclinical. It passes unnoticed without any symptoms. However, the chronic gastritis is uh, the disease that is responsible for most symptoms. This bacteria loves to live in the antrum of the stomach, so causing antral gastritis. And when it causes antral gastritis, it leads to stimulation of the G cells in the antrum with increased gastrin hormone production that in turn will stimulate the parietal cells in the body or the carpus to produce uh, uh, in the body or the fundus to produce um, uh, acid and this will lead to acid overproduction which will in the chronic uh, uh, on the long run lead to peptic ulceration so antral gastritis is associated with increased acid production and hyperacidity of the stomach leading to peptic ulceration now early on helicobacter pylori can cause antral gastritis however in severe cases it, the inflammation can extend to all over the stomach affecting even the body and the fundus causing pangastritis and causing damage to the parietal cells that are present in the body and the fundus so in these severe cases the bacteria can cause hypo secretion of the acid and achlorohedria which we call it achlorohedria that means there is no acid production in these severe cases there will be intestinal metaplasia in the stomach and the risk of gastric cancer is very much increased in most cases gastric cancer uh, are associated with a background of a chronic gastritis and intestinal metaplasia the intestinal metaplasia is then as it transformed to dysplasia then to adeno carcinoma so understanding the uh, the um, effect of helicobacter pylori in the stomach is very uh, important
Um, so, as I said, regarding the um, epidemiology of um, chronic gastritis uh, that is caused by helicobacter pylori, uh, there is a um, uh, very uh, well noticed difference in the incidence of H. pylori associated gastritis in different uh, geographic locations and in different uh, um, uh, populations. It is more common in uh, areas with poverty and uh, crowding and uh, patients with limited uh, education and poor sanitation. As I said, the infection is typically acquired in childhood through um, uh, consumption of uh, contaminated uh, water and food in these poor sani uh, sanitation areas. And the uh, Helicobacter pylori bacteria remains uh, in the stomach for uh, years without causing any uh, symptom. At some point uh, in life, they can uh, uh, trigger the irritation to the stomach and uh, they can cause the uh, chronic uh, gastritis, especially when the patient uh, reaches the adult life. So there is a crowd, there is a, a colonization rate. The colonization rate varies uh, according to the geographic location from as uh, little as 10% of the population to as much as 80% of the population uh, colonized with the bacteria. And as I said, this rate of colonization depends on the uh, poor sanitation uh, and uh, the hygienic conditions in that uh, population. So many of us may harbor the helicobacter pylori in our stomach with, uh, stomachs without causing any harm, but in certain uh, patients it can uh, start the uh, disease and causing chronic gastritis or peptic uh, ulcer. So the now the pathogenesis of Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori lives in the mucus layer. It's usually non-invasive, and even it can if it invades the mucosa, this is not the um, uh, mechanism by which it causes the disease. It can cause the disease while present present in the mucus layer, and it has developed many mechanisms to protect itself from the acidic gastric mucosa. The gastric acidity is an important defense mechanism uh, by the stomach against pathogens. So most pathogens and bacteria cannot withstand or live in this acidic environment, so uh, they are killed with this acidity. However, the Helicobacter pylori bacteria has developed many virulent mechanisms to help it stay within the mucus layer and causing the disease. One of these uh, virulent factors is the presence of flagelli, uh, flagella. So these uh, bacteria are motile bacteria and uh, this motility is due to the presence of flagella uh, which uh, helps them to move within the mucus uh, layer. Uh, the presence of urease enzyme. This is a very peculiar feature for Helicobacter pylori uh, bacteria. They produce the urease, which splits urea to ammonia. And the ammonia, as you know, has a, a high pH and it is an alkaline medium. So that uh, as if the bacteria is surrounding itself with an, uh, with an alkaline media to protect it uh, from the acidic pH of the uh, stomach, uh, localized uh, alkaline media. Another mechanism of uh, virulence is the presence of adhesins. These adhesins uh, helps the bacteria to adhere to the foveolar epithelial uh, cells of the stomach and also another mechanism is the production of toxins. The main toxin uh, that is produced by the Helicobacter pylori bacteria is the cytotoxin uh, associated uh, uh, gene A cytotoxin associated gene A encodes the CAG A which is very important uh, cytotoxin for the uh, ulcer development and the cancer development because it can cause damage to the epithelial cells. So these are the virulent factors that are developed by the Helicobacter pylori bacteria to stay alive within the acidic media of the stomach and by which it uses these um, virulent factors to uh, produce the disease. Flagelli, urease enzyme, adhesins, and toxins. The most important toxin is CAG-A. So now, how would the gastric biopsy or the gastric mucosa appears in a patient with a chronic gastritis? 
Uh, when the patient presents with the symptoms of chronic gastritis, like the epigastric pain, nausea, and vomiting, uh, sometimes the, the, the gastroenterologist offers an endoscopic procedure to uh, visualize the gastric mucosa. So during endoscopy, uh, there are certain features that can be seen, and during uh, after taking and the and the gastroenterologist also can take a gastric biopsy and send it to the pathology laboratory and we, we visualize this biopsy under the microscope. Regarding the endoscopy, uh, the most important feature that can be seen on the, in the gastric mucosa is the redness or the hyperemia. Uh, that is the inflammatory uh, response in the uh, stomach. Uh, on a biopsy, the preferred biopsy site for gas chronic gastritis is the antrum because each pylori likes or loves to live in the uh, antrum and it doesn't l uh, attach uh, attaching to the foveolar epithelium of the antrum. However, uh, it does not show any uh, presence in the um, acid producing uh, uh, mucosa like in the fundus or in the body except in very severe cases and um, even in the uh, duodenum even if when it causes duodenal uh, duodenitis or duodenal ulcers the bacteria still present in the stomach however the hyperacidity is the, part, the uh, uh, thing that causes the uh, duodenitis and duodenal ulcers so the preferred site for the biopsy is the antrum what we see is inflammatory response in the uh, mucosa uh, predominated by uh, plasma cells lymphocytes and macrophages in the lamina propria and the amount of these cells differs according to the severity of chronic gastritis in addition in active disease we can see the neutrophils the neutrophils in the lamina propria or even at, even attacking the uh, crypts and the glands of the uh, antrum and sometimes uh, causing small abscesses. The uh, helicobacter pylori can be seen and visualized within the mucus layer and as I said we can see the bacteria in the antrum. However, we can't visualize it in biopsies taken from the fundus or from the body or even in areas with intestinal metaplasia as the complication of a chronic gastritis. Uh, also, uh, in more severe uh, cases, we can see lymphoid aggregates, lymphoid follicles with reactive germinal centers as part of the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And this, the presence of these lymphoid aggregates also increases the risk for lymphoma, uh, malt lymphoma, lymphoma uh, associated with mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. We call it malt lymphoma. Also, in long-standing disease and complicated disease, we can see intestinal metaplasia, in which we can see intestinal type epithelium with goblet cells, like the ones we talked about when we mentioned or when we discussed Parrot's uh, esophagus in uh, reflux uh, uh, esophagitis. So intestinal metaplasia can occur in the stomach after a long-standing chronic gastritis caused by helicobacter pylori gastritis. This intestinal metaplasia can progress to dysplasia and this then to invasive adenocarcinoma. So you can see that helicobacter pylori can increase the risk for malt lymphoma and for gastric adenocarcinoma. And the morphology under the microscope of chronic gastritis depends on the severity of the inflammation. The preferred site of the biopsy is the antrum of the stomach. So um, here you can see three microscopic uh, pictures for uh, a patient with the chronic gastritis. Uh, the first one to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, left to the right of the uh, slide uh, represents a Wharton starry silver stain, and you can see here the multiple. Uh, uh, curved 
curved uh, rods or the curved bacilli with black discoloration uh, with this type of stain and these uh, bacilli represents the helicobacter pylori bacteria so it's uh, it's an easier way to see the bacteria in a gastric biopsy specimen rather the hematoxylin and ESN stain in the uh, adjacent in the middle slide you can see a lymphoid follicle with reactive germinal center a lot of lymphocytes uh, infiltrating between the gastric glands in the lamina propria this indicates the chronic gastritis we have a lot of chronic inflammatory cells and uh, to the um, uh, last slide represents a lot of uh, neutrophils this indicates an active uh, disease and we call it a chronic active gastritis in which there is a lot of uh, uh, neutrophils even invading the surface epithelial cells uh, as I said uh, when I discussed the acute gastritis, the presence of neutrophils is not required for diagnosis of uh, acute or even chronic gastritis. The presence of neutrophils indicates an active disease. So here it's a chronic uh, because of the presence of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the lamina propria, because of presence of the lymphoid follicles, but because of the presence of neutrophils, the disease is called active disease. And these biopsies are all taken from the antrum. Here, this slide represents the more the feared complication of a chronic gastritis associated with Helicobacter pylori infection, and you can see the intestinal metaplasia and the presence of these goblet cells that are characterized by uh, uh, abundant uh, um, cytoplasm filled with the mucus or mucin. You can see it here, having a uh, a gray uh, or bluish a gray discoloration and it can be also highlighted by other uh, special uh, stains uh, this uh, ty these types of cells uh, can have a bluish look when we uh, use the um, alchin blue special stain for mucin so this is intestinal metaplasia which is a complication of long-standing helicobacter pylori infection the long-term irritation of the mucosa by helicobacter pylori can and led to this complication and this is very important to know about because it increases the risk for dysplasia and adenocarcinoma of the stomach so any patient uh, who have chronic gastritis and uh, develops intestinal metaplasia should be followed uh, with the co consecutive uh, endoscopic procedures and multiple biopsies uh, to detect any dysplastic uh, event before it uh, transforms to uh, invasive malignancy so we can detect it uh, earlier and save the patient so how we diagnose a patient with helicobacter pylori chronic gastritis first the patient presents with the symptoms the epigastric pain the nausea and vomiting and the longer duration of these symptoms then the uh, doctor offers some investigations that are um, non-invasive and then some invasive investigations the to diagnose uh, the patient with helicobacter pylori gastritis the non-invasive investigations includes a blood test serologic test for the anti h pylori antibodies which are the iga antibodies and the igg antibodies the problem with this test is that it does not mean always that the patient is having an active disease because if you have a previous infection with helicobacter pylori bacteria you might have developed uh, an immune reaction and an igg antibodies in your blood so the presence of the antibodies does not mean that you have an active disease right now the other non-invasive method is the stool test for helicobacter pylori uh, microorganism and uh, also a urea breath test uh, i will discuss the urea breath test in the next slide the other invasive uh, investigations or invasive procedures is offering an upper endoscopy for those patients uh, in order to visualize the stomach uh, first and then to take a gastric biopsy which is considered the best way uh, for uh, uh, detecting the presence of a chronic gastritis and inflammatory reaction and for visualizing the helicobacter pylori bacteria in the mucus layer and as i said the best site for the biopsy is the antrum of the uh, stomach 
Uh, then this biopsy also can be used for bacterial cultures or for PCR test polymerase chain reaction test for the bacterial DNA. So all of these uh, diagnostic methods can be used to diagnose the chronic gastritis uh, associated with H. pylori uh, bacteria. Now, what's the treatment? The treatment is uh, the eradication therapy for H. pylori, which is formed of at least two antibiotics uh, in addition to the proton bump inhibitor to decrease gastric acidity. The uh, treatment may need a long uh, uh, period of time. The patient should complete the medications uh, in order to eradicate the uh, bacteria. Sometimes some patients that do not complete the medications may have a recurrence of Helicobacter pylori. It means that the bacteria was not eradicated from the first treatment or they might develop a reinfection later on in their lives. So this is the urea breath test. The main idea about the urea breath test is that uh, we detect the uh, products of the urease enzyme produced by the bacteria. So the patient will uh, consume or drink a, a solution that contains the urea material and this urea material um, uh, is uh, uh, containing a radiolabeled carbon uh, radiolabeled carbon and uh, then after that the uh, patient uh, is uh, uh, left for about 20 minutes after drinking this solution and then we will detect the presence of the radio labeled carbon in the breath of the patient the patient is given like a bag to breath uh, to breathe in it and we detect the presence of the radioactive carbon in the uh, uh, exhaled uh, exhaled air how we detect this carbon as you know the bacteria produces the urease enzyme and this urease enzyme will split the urea that the patient uh, drank uh, into an ammonia and carbon dioxide. This CO2, a carbon dioxide, contains a radiolabeled carbon. So the presence of red this radiolabeled carbon in the um, exhaled air from the patient indicates that there is a mechanism uh, that is splitted the urea into ammonia and uh, this carbon dioxide. So this is uh, um, considered a, a proof uh, that the uh, patient is uh, having the helicobacter pylori in his uh, stomach. The second type of gastritis is called autoimmune gastritis or autoimmune atrophic gastritis. In this type of gastritis, it is characterized by antibodies produced by the body against the parietal uh, cells, which are the acid producing cells and the intrinsic factor producing cells in the stomach. So autoimmune gastritis is an immune mediated disease directed against the parietal cells and as we said parietal cells are present in the body and the fundus damage to these parietal cells by this immune reaction will lead to loss of acid production and loss of intrinsic factor production and even the antibodies also can be directed to the intrinsic factor itself causing its inactivation this intrinsic factor is used produced by the stomach and uh, binds to the vitamin B12 and aids in its absorption in the um, distal ileum. So the damage to the intrinsic factor or the uh, lack of its production uh, will lead to a vitamin B12 uh, deficiency and pernicious anemia, which has many neurological manifestations, which is part of the autoimmune gastritis. Another feature of autoimmune gastritis is reduced serum pepsinogen 1 levels, uh, which is this pepsinogen 1 is produced by uh, cells uh, of the uh, body and the fundus of the stomach. And because of the damage to this part of the stomach in autoimmune gastritis, we will uh, have reduced levels of pepsinogen 1 in the serum. Also, as a response to the loss of acid production from the body and the fundus of the stomach, we will have a reflux reflex g cell hyperplasia in the antrum the g cells are the cells producing gastrin 
which is produced in uh, a response to the loss of acid production in the stomach. So we will end up with G cell hyperplasia in the antrum. Typically, autoimmune gastritis spares the antrum, unlike Helicobacter pylori gastritis, which typically affects the antrum. And typically also, autoimmune gastritis is characterized by deficient gastric acid secretion, which is called achlorohydria, achlorohydria, in opposite to Helicobacter pylori gastritis, which is characterized by increased gastric acid production. So we will have a chlorohydria in autoimmune gastritis. We will have damage to the fundic uh, and body mucosa of the stomach, and we will result. Uh, we will have hypergastrinemia. These are the main features of autoimmune gastritis. So you can see that H. pylori gastritis and autoimmune gastritis has many different features. Um, between them and uh, the, the, they are uh, uh, almost opposite features. Autoimmune gastritis affects the body and fundus. Bainamal H. pylori gastritis affects the antrum. In autoimmune gastritis, the acid production is decreased due to the damage to the acid producing cells in the body and fundus and the G cell hyperplasia in the antrum. Bainamal H. pylori gastritis, we have increased acid production and hyper acidity of the uh, stomach so again the pathogenesis of autoimmune gastritis is from its name immune mediated we have antibodies produced by the body and directed against the parietal cells of the body and the fundus of the stomach which will lead to loss of these cells and the loss of parietal cells will lead to reductions in acid production and intrinsic factor secretion. In addition, we have also antibodies directed against the intrinsic factor itself. The reduced acid production will lead to reflex hypergastrinemia and hyperplasia of the antral gastrin producing cells, the G cells of the uh, antrum. Uh, deficient intrinsic factor, as we said, will lead to deficient absorption of vitamin B12 in the ileum and to megaloplastic anemia, which have many neurological manifestations. In fact, minority of patients with autoimmune gastritis will develop this pernicious anemia, but it is used as a very important uh, factor to differentiate um, autoimmune gastritis from helicobacter pylori gastritis. We have also some chief cell damage in the body of the stomach uh, uh, resulting in reduced pepsinogen uh, production. So the pathogenesis as you see is mainly immune mediated. It is considered an autoimmune disease and uh, with a progression of the disease there will be total loss of the parietal cells in the body and the fundus with thinning and atrophy of the mucosa and loss of the folds of the stomach at these uh, sites. The morphology of the gastric biopsy in autoimmune gastritis is somehow different from that seen in uh, H. pylori gastritis. Uh, indeed, the H. pylori organisms are absent in this type of gastritis, and uh, the preferred biopsy site is uh, the body or the uh, fundus of the stomach, uh, not the antrum of the stomach, because if we take an antral biopsy, uh, it will be uh, almost uh, unremarkable, especially early in the disease. The body and the fundus of the stomach will have loss of the auxentic uh, mucosa or the parietal cell loss. Uh, with time, there will be diffuse atrophy and thinning of the wall of the body and the fundus and loss of the folds due to loss of these acid producing uh, cells and their damage. The main inflammatory infiltrate is lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages, chronic inflammatory cells, and less likely you find the neutrophils like those uh, which we mentioned in Helicobacter pylori gastritis. But uh, on the long run, on the chronic uh, autoimmune gastritis, uh, 
the patient might uh, develop intestinal metaplasia due to the achlorohedria and, and the uh, absent acid uh, production. This intestinal metaplasia could progress to dysplasia or even adenocarcinoma. So in both H. pylori gastritis and autoimmune gastritis, there is a risk for development of gastric adenocarcinoma. But here also in autoimmune gastritis, we have a neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia G-cell hyperplasia in the antrum as a response for the loss of acidity. And in the long run, this G-cell hyperplasia may transform into neuroendocrine tumors. So um, again, the uh, uh, autoimmune gastritis might increase the risk for gastric adenocarcinoma and for gastric neuroendocrine tumors. But for helicobacter pylori gastritis, also we have intestinal metaplasia uh, and increased risk of gastric adenocarcinoma in addition to increased risk of malt lymphoma. This type of gastritis typically affects female patients there is a slight female predominance patients are in their 60s slightly higher uh, age than uh, for those patients with helicobacter pylori uh, gastritis and often uh, autoimmune gastritis is associated with other autoimmune diseases like the patient may have uh, um, Hashimoto thyroiditis or type 1 diabetes mellitus or Graves disease of the thyroid uh, autoimmune diseases usually tend to cluster together so when we have an autoimmune gastritis the patient might have also other autoimmune uh, diseases okay this table is very important it um, summarizes all the differences that we already mentioned in the uh, lecture regarding h pylori associated gastritis autoimmune ga uh, gastritis and autoimmune gastritis so uh, this table summarizes all the differences regarding the location as we said h pylori gastritis is mainly in the antrum except in severe cases it can transform to pan gastritis involving the all the stomach in autoimmune gastritis, the disease is mainly in the body and the fundus and it spares the antrum. The inflammatory infiltrate in H. pylori gastritis is characterized by the presence of chronic inflammatory cells in addition to neutrophils. However, in autoimmune gastritis, it's mainly chronic inflammatory cells, including lymphocytes, plasma cells, and macrophages. And regarding the acid production, H. pylori gastritis is characterized by increased acid production or if there is an, a decrease uh, in cases of uh, very uh, severe uh, pan gastritis associated with H. pylori gastritis we might have a slightly decreased acid production but not um, uh, achlorohydria. In autoimmune gastritis we have decreased acid production and in severe cases we might have achlorohydria, loss of acid production at all. Regarding the gastrin production, it is markedly increased in autoimmune gastritis as a response to the decreased acid production by enema. In H. pylori gastritis, it's uh, usually normal gastrin uh, level. Uh, in severe cases, we might have it markedly increased due to the uh, decreased acid production. But the in uh, as a rule, we we don't have markedly increased uh, gastrin level in early H. pylori gastritis. Uh, other lesions that can be seen in the stomach in H. pylori uh, gastritis, we might have uh, hyperplastic inflammatory polyps. We will discuss them in the next lectures. lecture. Uh, these polyps arise on the background of uh, uh, chronic H. pylori gastritis. However, in autoimmune gastritis, we might have neuroendocrine uh, G-cell hyperplasia uh, in the antrum. Serologic tests. In H. pylori gastritis, we might have the antibodies against the H. pylori microorganism. However, in autoimmune gastritis, we have antibodies to the parietal cells and antibodies to the intrinsic factor. The sequel of H. pylori gastritis, we said that it can progress to peptic ulcer disease as a complication, and it also increases the risk for adenocarcinoma and for malt lymphoma. However, in autoimmune gastritis, 
it can progress to atrophic gastritis to uh, patients could have pernicious anemia and there is an increased risk of adenocarcinoma as well as neuroendocrine tumors we call them uh, carcinoid tumors the associations h pylori gastritis is usually associated with poverty and crowding and uh, low socioeconomic status as we mentioned but in autoimmune gastritis Patients usually do have a concurrent other autoimmune diseases like thyroiditis, diabetes mellitus type 1, and Graves disease. So this table is very important it, and it summarizes all the main differences between H. pylori gastritis and autoimmune gastritis.